Chapter twenty nine of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty nine The Larger Monkeys though most of the best specimens of monkey beauty belong to the new world the richness and variety of the colouring of one or two of the african species is not surpassed by that of any american species yet the ornamental value of their skins is little known even among those professionally engaged in the fur trade in the catalogues of the great sales at sir charles lampson's in college street there is always a column headed various to which the visitor tired with the enumeration of the regular commercial skins by the hundred thousand always turns with a sense of curiosity most of these are dressed skins of exceptional rarity and beauty sold separately and not in lots like the pelts of moustache beaver and bear and exhibited in a room by themselves instead of by sample in the last of these great sales which the writer attended the collection in the room set apart for this purpose was exceptionally interesting and the buyer of one of the great wholesale fur dealers marked several of the lots for purchase a row of fourteen skins of the northern manchurian tiger with long deep fur and magnificent markings of rich tawny and white was perhaps the most striking feature in the room but dozens of leopard and lynx hides chinese coats of tibetan lamb fleece inwards ocelot tiger cat and even python skins made up a richly coloured and curious collection turning over a pile of small unnamed skins lying on a trestle table the buyer discovered a set of monkey hides of a species quite unknown to him the prevailing colour was a beautiful iron grey and in the centre of each skin was an oval scutcheon of the richest chestnut brown these were at once marked for purchase and next day the writer identified the species to which the skins belonged by a visit to the zoo they were those of the diana monkey of west africa a creature which though of a thorough monkey type has almost the colouring of some of the most ornamental wild ducks its face is black with a white crescent on the forehead and a long white beard and a white throat and shoulders the rest of the body and forelegs is mainly of a tint of iron grey speckled all over with a pepper and salt arrangement of dots in the centre of the back is the deep chestnut patch which has such a curious effect in the dressed skin and the lower parts are a brilliant pale yellow the diana monkey now in the gardens is an extremely friendly creature and spends much time in stroking and arranging its beautiful fur one kept in confinement is said to have always drawn its beard aside with the hand to prevent its being soiled when drinking the moustache monkey though not so brightly coloured as the diana is in many respects a most beautiful creature it is a medium-sized monkey five or six times larger than the tiny squirrel monkey of guinea but the scheme and method of its colouring is much the same with the substitution of powder blue for gamboge in most of the self-coloured monkeys the whole body seems permeated with some particular colouring matter black blue yellow or green as the case may be just as human beings who have been dosed with nitrate of silver acquire a violet tinge the colour is brightest in the skin especially on the face and hands but extends all over the body shows between the roots of the soft fur and seems to climb the hair and colour the stalk just as the green liquid in which a white carnation is placed ascends into the flower and tinges it with an unnatural dye in the moustache monkey the face and lips are a beautiful powder blue the eyes bluish smoke colour the inside of the ears as blue as a hyacinth and the skin which shows between the soft hair on the arms legs and chest a paler turquoise shade which makes the greyish fur of the lower parts a chinchilla colour the fur on the back is of yellow and black mixed shading into the grey of the abdomen by gradual changes the inmates of the main cages in the centre of the house with the exception of the capuchins are nearly all old-world species and exhibit much that is strange and interesting and a good deal that is repulsive in monkey characteristics 
though the cages seemed first to contain a chance medley of all sorts the monkeys are really distributed with due regard to affinities of continent and species and a synoptic view of the various tribes behind the bars shows better than any book the manner in which certain monkey types like particular races of mankind have either advanced or receded over great tracts of continent the sole european monkey has retreated literally to the last stone of the continent and only lives on the great cliff of the rock of gibraltar in the vertical face of which it still maintains itself midway between sky and sea on the cliffs of the opposite coast they are more plentiful and its name of barbary ape is more appropriate than any european title that at the zoo is a female a large heavy round-backed monkey with olive-tinted fur a dull morose face and a by no means pleasant temper like most large monkeys it is a far heavier stronger and more active creature than it appears to be when sitting bunched up on the floor the big monkeys not only the baboons but creatures like the large macaques and the chinese and japanese monkeys have the power of leaping suddenly in almost any direction without any previous contraction of the limbs or body they may be sitting in the most listless and apparently dejected attitude and yet in a moment fling themselves upon an enemy inflict a frightful bite and be away before he has time for defence or retaliation the large chinese jelly monkey outside the house will usually give an example of this form of monkey tactics it is a long-legged short-bodied powerful creature extremely heavy and contemplative in manner and it must be owned an ugly unpleasant-looking brute though it is both loyal and attached to its keeper if a visitor pretends to strike the keeper or use any rough gesture to him the monkey catches up and flings whatever missile happens to be at hand straight at the offender's head following the shot itself with a furious and sudden leap which if not stopped by the bars would bring the animal full upon the head and shoulders of the person attacked if nothing else is available the monkey flings a handful of sawdust with violence and precision thus preparing the way for the onset by partly blinding the enemy both the sudden leap and the missile are characteristic of monkey attack though the last is the special weapon of the chinese and japanese apes in the pine forests of their native country they fling the large and heavy pine cones not light fir cones but solid and substantial missiles at the heads of intruders and the pelting of coolies by the apes is a not unfrequent subject of chinese and japanese paintings the japanese ape occupies an outside cage at the opposite end of the house to that inhabited by the chelly monkey which it much resembles in the large cages in the centre of the monkey house the animals are mainly grouped geographically african monkeys such as the velvet marbrook grivet and green monkey are in one compartment capuchins and other south american monkeys in a second indian monkeys in a third one of the most friendly and amusing is a little bonnet monkey not much bigger than a rat its face is exactly like that of an old chinaman with the slanting eyes flat short nose wrinkled and surprised cast of expression long upper lip and hair growing backwards with a parting another odd little monkey is the little java pigtail bob he is a most friendly little fellow running up and catching hold of the keeper's arm the moment he comes near the cage or putting its arms round his neck if he leans with his back against the wires bob keeps the whole cage full in good spirits with his tricks he is not the least afraid of any visitor catching hold of a human hand or arm in the most familiar way though his attention may be mainly engaged in what is going on among the monkeys though so many species of monkeys are now known there is always the chance of the discovery of some unknown and monstrous ape because these are always animals living in the region of the great forests near the equator great forests are now well understood to be the most inaccessible portions of the earth 
it is no paradox to say that the range of life in the ocean abyss where the explorer gropes for creatures which have invaded regions lying below miles of superincumbent ocean in eternal darkness and everlasting cold may be better known in fifty years than the list of inhabitants of the central african forest with its horrible incubus of twilight gloom and the matted tangle of encroaching vegetation which rises solid and unbroken from the rotten soil beneath to the towering and electric clouds and vapours that brood upon its upper surface this forbidding region is probably the home of monkeys large and small of strange forms and unknown habits which will from time to time find their way to the zoo and astonish the visitors to the monkey house as much as the first arrival of the orangutan and the gorilla even from the well-known indian hills a monkey arrived lately which was quite new to the experience of connoisseurs and it was at first pronounced to be a hybrid between a rhesus and a macaque it is a large solemn monkey with thick van dyke brown fur and round tranquil brown eyes as deliberate in its movements as the larger apes further information identified this monkey as a true macaque from the little Himalayan state of sikkim the doubts as to its identity can hardly be a matter for surprise for the question of the possession of the state of sikkim itself was only recently settled between the indian and the chinese empires after a small frontier war and protracted negotiations so much has been written on the question of monkey temper and monkey talk that the conclusions of one who has for twelve years watched them daily fed them in health and disease and has besides that form of insight into animal character which seems innate in some persons to a very high and exceptional degree deserve some attention eustace jungblut a german of bremen is the chief keeper of the monkey palace tall handsome fair with the figure of an athlete and the sound sense of one who prefers to observe and think than to think and make observations square with theory he also speaks english french and dutch well and expresses himself with great clearness so far as the present writer has been able to gather his views in conversation he absolutely disbelieves in any form of universal monkey speech though each species has its own special sounds of fear or pleasure which are naturally interpreted aright by others of the same kind the capuchin monkeys remain good-tempered always as do many of the smaller species but as a rule monkey temper fails after the animals have been for four or five years in the gardens and they become uncertain and often unsafe an ounce of fact is worth a pound of theory a large monkey escaped in the evening when it was being transferred to another cage it dodged the net and was outside and had disappeared almost in a moment it could not be found and spent the night out next morning it was discovered in a tree and shot before the gardens opened it had been sent to the zoo because it was a troublesome and it was not considered safe to leave it at large even for a morning End of chapter twenty nine Chapter thirty of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish This Librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty lizards and crocodiles at the zoo it is hardly matter for surprise that the colubrin snakes with their gorgeous coloring and wonderful form or the poisonous cobras rattlesnakes and puff adders which inhabit the closed cases in the reptile house at the zoo excite more interest and comment among visitors than the four-footed reptiles ranging from the alligators of south america to the tiny gecko lizards of southern europe which have their abode under the same roof yet there is something peculiarly interesting in these modern survivors of the ancient saurians which swarmed in the hot and steaming waters of a prehistoric world and seem like the elephants and rhinoceroses to carry the imagination back to the circumstances and surroundings of a previous though still more ancient era 
it may perhaps be taken as evidence of the unfitness of such survivals for modern times that the only inhabitants of the reptile house which seem to invite unqualified dislike and disgust are the crocodiles and alligators which swarm in the large oval tank in the centre it seems at first somewhat strange that creatures many of which are of a strength and ferocity almost equal to that of the largest carnivora could be kept in safety within the slight barrier formed by the incurved railing which surrounds the pool but the natural strength of the alligator is only equalled by its sluggishness and the hideous beasts are content to doze and feed all day in the warm and steaming water the art of crocodile culture is now fairly understood and when the baby basilisk is transferred from the cool depths of the watering-pot in which he spends his infancy in the nurseries behind the snake's quarters to the tropical temperature of the tank it thrives apace the monster alligator which now measures some ten feet in length came from the mississippi when about twelve months old nine years ago hideous huge and hide-bound in armour of horn it swings round like an enormous elf and as it lies just beneath the surface of the water shows more clearly than any book can picture the curious adaptation to surroundings of the carnivorous water lizard the eyes on their raised orbits are like dormer windows in the head the nostrils are two tiny slits in a raised boss at the end of the nose apparently the sluggish beast is a quick breather for the respirations are at the rate of twenty-eight per minute or nearly double those of a man at rest another alligator has been in the collection for twenty-two years but does not equal the size of the later comer owing it is said to the early days spent in the cold and cramped quarters provided before the building of the new house it is however a formidable creature and as it sprawls on its stomach across the big tree stump in the centre with its ugly webbed claws dangling on either side its mouth partly open and its tail drooping in the water its appearance is sufficiently repulsive to deter the most well-meaning visitor from offering the charitable bun crocodiles from the nile india and ceylon share the waters with the alligators the crocodile evidently bears the same analogy to the alligator as the frog to the toad it is lighter in colour and in build and a more active as well as a more malicious creature neither is it so entirely hideous though the lower jaw shows projecting tusks like those of a wild boar the creature's eyes celebrated in connection with the crocodile tears with which legend declared that it attracted its sympathizing victims to the bank of the stream are highly decorative if not beautiful the head narrow and flat resembles the head of a snake the nose is sharp and the fixed and motionless eyes are of the palest dusty gold set in a short horny pillar of a deeper golden brown the crocodile's coat of armor is less complete than that of the alligator and its quick vivacious movements make it far more troublesome to the keepers when the tank has to be refilled and cleansed than the big alligators which will allow themselves to be used as stepping stones as the water ebbs away the crocodiles and their kin exhaust the list of noxious lizards at the zoo with one curious exception the heloderon a fat and torpid lizard from arizona is supposed to be the sole existing member of its tribe which possesses not only the poison glands which exist in most of the toads but also the true poison teeth with a channel for the emission of the venom the lizard is about one and a half feet long with a fat fleshy body a round tail ending in a blunt point and a flat head with squared sides resembling a small padlock the whole body is covered with a curious coat of scales like black and pink beads arranged in an arabesque pattern in its daily life it is a dull and stupid creature feeding mainly on eggs which it breaks and laps with its tongue its first and only victim was a guinea pig which was put into its cage with a view to testing the reports as to its poisonous nature which were by no means universally credited 
the lizard bit the guinea pig in the leg and the animal died in a minute and a half almost as soon as after the bite of a cobra eggs are favorite food with many lizards and snakes but the monitor a very large and handsome lizard approaching the size of the half-grown crocodile is perhaps the most remarkable egg swaller of the tribe it bolts the eggs unbroken and the oval morsel may be watched in its slow descent down the long neck until it disappears in the lower regions many of the smaller lizards in the house are almost unmatched for quaintness of form and beauty of coloring among the inhabitants of the zoo it sometimes happens that the chameleons die in winter before the summer stock has arrived to take their place as most of those brought from the cape die when the vessels enter the cold atmosphere of the english channel but the horned lizards of california are hardly less amusing in form and habits than the true chameleons shaped like a miniature sole their backs bristling with pinkish spikes like the thorns of a briar rose they bury themselves in the sand at the bottom of their cage until the head only projects presenting an exact resemblance to one of the thorny burrs which lie scattered on the californian desert if possible the lizard remains still until the spiders and other insects walk unsuspecting into its mouth but at the zoo where insects are scarce the horned lizards have to some extent abandoned concealment and rush upon their prey with a suddenness and ferocity most amusing in such tiny creatures the writer watched a violent contest between a horned lizard and a gecko for the possession of a mealworm which was wriggling on the sand the gecko one of the swift and agile little lizards which are so common in southern europe was darting down from a branch above just as the horned lizard made its spring and each seized the mealworm at opposite ends in the tug of war which followed the ground lizard proved an easy winner and the gecko retired defeated to finish pulling off its old skin which hung loosely round its shoulders like a jacket the cast skin which was of an exquisite semi-transparent gray color like that of a moonstone was pulled off by the lizard in long strips by the aid of its teeth and feet the toads perform this operation in a far neater manner pulling their cast skins over their heads with their hands as a football player strips off his jersey perhaps the tamest if not the most beautiful among the smaller reptiles are the odd little palm lizards which have recently arrived at the zoo they are vegetable feeders and their appetite for cabbage leaves is so keen and the diet supplied so liberal that after a hearty meal they resemble a well-stuffed oval pincushion with a small lizard's head feet and tail attached to the padding yet even in this condition they are ready to eat if fresh food be offered to them sitting contentedly in the visitor's hand and swelling visibly as they munch their cabbage like the lady who excited the alarm of mr weller senior at the temperance tea a near neighbor of the palm lizards is the existing type of the impostor frog who tried to inflate himself to the size of the bullock according to the fable aesop's frog no doubt lived in the swamps of lake copias but the strange creature which naturalists have named the adorned ceratophorus but which is nothing but an enormous fat round caricature of a frog with a mouth wide enough to swallow a young chicken lives in south america his daily habit is to bury himself in the loose earth where small animals such as rats mice and other frogs and the young of ground birds ducks or chickens are likely to wander half covered with dry earth the frog resembles a patch of greenish wet moss on wet mud the chicken or rat which approaches this is immediately seized by an enormous mouth which opens and shuts with a snap like the back of a watch like other selfish and greedy people this frog is extremely short-tempered and resentful when its own comfort is interfered with and when poked and otherwise teased swells its body out to nearly double its original size and slowly hops with gasps and growls after its tormentor in a paroxysm of rage and excitement
End of chapter 30Chapter thirty one of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one From the Animal's Point of View The immunity of the keepers at the zoo from serious injury or attack by the animals in their charge is a priori evidence that the animal's point of view is not necessarily hostile one of the most curious and unconsciously paradoxical claims ever advanced for man in his relation to animals is that by which uh, m georges leroy philosopher encyclopedist and uh, lieutenant uh, des chasses of the park of versailles the vindicator of buffon and montesquieu against the criticisms of voltaire explains in his lettre sur les animaux the intellectual debt which the carnivorous animals owe to human persecution he pictures with wonderful cleverness the development of their powers of forethought memory and reasoning which the interference of man the enemy and rival forces upon them and the consequent intellectual advance which distinguishes the loup jean et ignorant from the loup adulte et instruit the philosophic lieutenant de chasse had before long ample opportunities for comparing the affinities which he had discovered between civilized man and instructed wolves in the experiences of the french revolution but without following his fortunes in those troublous times for game preservers we may perhaps return to the question of the natural relation of animals to man which as pictured by rousseau to prove his a priori notions of a state of nature so justly incurred the criticism of the practical observer and practised writer m georges leroy that man is generally speaking from the animal's point of view an object of fear hostility or rapine is to-day most unfortunately true but whether this is their natural relation and not one induced and capable perhaps of change is by no means certain savage man who has generally been first in contact with animals is usually a hunter and therefore an object of dislike to the other hunting animals and of dread to the hunted but civilized man with his supply of bread and beef is not necessarily a hunter and it is just conceivable that he might be content to leave the animals in a newly discovered country unmolested and condescend when not better employed to watch their attitude towards himself the impossible island in the swiss family robinson in which half the animals of two hemispheres were collected would be an ideal place for such an experiment but unfortunately uninhabited islands seldom contain more than a few species and those are generally birds or sea beasts and in newly discovered game regions savage man has generally been before us with his arrows spears and pitfalls some instances of the first contact of animals with man have however been preserved in the accounts of the early voyages collected by hacklet and others though the hungry navigators were generally more intent on victualling their ships with the unsuspecting beasts and birds or on noting those which would be useful commodities for traffic than in cultivating friendly relations with the animal inhabitants of the newly discovered islands thus we read that near newfoundland there were islands of birds of a sandy red but with the multitudes of birds upon them they look white the birds sit there as thick as stones lie in a paved street the greatest of the islands is about a mile in compass the second is a little less the third is a very little one like a small rock at the second of these islands there lay on the shore in the sunshine about thirty or forty sea oxen or morses which when our boat came near them presently made into the sea and swam after the boat curiosity not fear or hostility was then the emotion roused in the sea oxen by the first sight of man the birds whales and walruses in the wargate sea and near yon man's island were no less tame and the sea lions in the southern pacific the birds that barents first discovered in novaya zembla and even the antelopes 
which the early explorers encountered in the least inhabited parts of central south africa seem all to have regarded the newly discovered creature man with interest and without fear sir samuel baker in his wild beasts and their ways remarks on the curious and inexplicable fact that certain animals and birds exhibit a peculiar shyness of human beings although they are only exposed to the same conditions as others which are more bold he instances the wildness of the curlew and the golden plover and contrasts it with the tameness of swallows and wagtails the reason does not seem far to seek the first are constantly sought for food the latter are left undisturbed perhaps the best instance of such a contrast is that of the hawfinch and the crossbill birds of closely allied form and appearance the hawfinch which is probably the shyest of english small birds seems to have acquired a deep mistrust of man but the crossbills on the rare occasions when they descend from the uninhabited forests of the north into our scotch or english woods are absolutely without fear or mistrust of human beings whom they see very probably for the first time when animals do show fear on first acquaintance it is probably due not to any spontaneous dread of man as man but because they mistake him for something else nearly all animals says sir samuel baker have some natural enemy which keeps them on the alert and makes them suspicious of all strange objects and sounds that might denote the approach of danger and it is to this that he attributes the timidity of many kinds of game in districts where they have never been attacked by firearms a most curious instance of this mistaken identity occurred lately when kerguelen island was visited by h m s forlog and a party of naturalists and astronomers to observe the transit of venus there were large colonies of penguins nesting on the island which though the place is so little frequented by man used at first to run away up the slopes inland when the sailors appeared they apparently took the men for seals and thus took what appeared the natural way of escaping from their marine enemies they soon found out their mistake for it is said that when they became accustomed to being chased by men an experience for which the sailors seemed to have given them every opportunity the penguins acquired the habit of taking to the water at the first alarm in another colony the nestling females would settle down peacefully on their eggs if the visitors stood still the whole of this community of penguins they numbered about two thousand were subsequently boiled down into hare soup for the officers and men of h m s volagen writes the rev a e eaton and very nice they found it we may compare with this destruction of the penguins the letter of hacklet on the voyage to newfoundland by antony parkhurst describing with high approval the business facilities for the fishing trade offered by the tameness of the great auks called penguins in the passage there are seagulls musses ducks and many other kinds of birds store too long to write about especially at one island named penguin where we may drive them on a plank into our ship as many as shall aid her these birds are also called penguins and cannot fly there is more meat in one of them than in a goose the frenchmen that fish near the grand bank do bring small store of flesh with them but do victual themselves always with these birds the point of view from which the lion or tiger looks on man is perhaps not so far removed from that of the non-carnivorous creatures as might be supposed man is certainly not the natural food of any animal except of sharks and alligators if he is so rash as to go out of his native element into theirs and if the item man were subtracted from the bill of fare of all the carnivora they would never want a meal the notion of the natural attitude of a lion to a young lady when as that tender virgin he did spy upon her he did run full greedily to have at once devoured her tender course is still popular but hardly correct more probably the lion would get out of the way politely if we may judge by the pacific behaviour of those in our last explored lion haunt mashonaland 
M. Georges Leroy's contention for the natural affinity or semi-sympathy which should exist between man and the intelligent hunting animals is no doubt partly reasonable lee hunt when recording his impressions of a visit to the zoological gardens was unpleasantly struck by the incongruity of the notion of being eaten by a wild beast the hideous impractical fellow-creature looking one in the face struggling with us mingling his breath with ours tearing away scalp or shoulder-blade but the fellow-creature is not nearly so impractical as he is supposed to be more human beings are probably killed by tigers than by any other wild beast except by starving wolves yet this is what sir samuel baker has to say on the subject there is a great difference in the habits of tigers some exist upon the game in the jungles others prey especially upon the flocks belonging to the villagers a few are designated man-eaters these are sometimes naturally ferocious and having attacked a human being may have devoured the body and thus acquired a taste for human flesh or they may have been wounded on more than one occasion and have learnt to regard man as a natural enemy but more frequently the man-eater is a very old tiger or more probably tigress that having hunted in the neighbourhood of villages and carried off some unfortunate woman has discovered that it is far easier to kill a native than to hunt jungle game as a rule the tiger is only anxious to avoid men and it is noticed that in high grass tigers are more dangerous than in forests because in the former they cannot be seen neither can they see until the stranger is close upon them an ancient instance of the opposite behaviour is that recorded of the new colonists of samaria whom the lions attacked and slew some of them a curious inversion of this experience occurred when the islands in the brahmaputra which were swarming with tigers were first cultivated the natives mainly by the aid of traps set with a bow and arrow killed off the tigers so fast that the skins were sold by auction at from eight annas to one rupee apiece in this case the tigers were the first aggressors by carrying off cattle but it seems evident that there exists no a priori reason founded in natural antipathy why man and animals if we could reconstruct a state of nature in which we could put civilized not savage man should not dwell together in profound peace or at least in such peace as obtains between accidental neighbours the only ground for quarrel that seems inevitable is the everlasting one between the shepherd and the wolf and that after all is a question not of prejudice but of property End of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two Possible Pets. The number of animals which, with ordinary tact and kindness, can be tamed by man is so great that the range of possible pets would seem almost coextensive with the limits of the animal world but tame tigers must as a rule remain a luxury for sultans and sarah bernhardts and the sociable bear be left to the professional gentlemen who make a living from his society we say as a rule not without reason because there is hardly any limit to an englishman's fancy for pets the writer was requested last year to act as a friendly broker to bid for the bear which found its way so often to the london police courts after being exhibited before the queen at windsor the would-be purchaser was a worthy butcher before whose shop the bear was being exhibited while the writer heard its history from the genial and dirty foreigner who owned it sir said the butcher excuse the liberty but would you kindly ask that frenchman what he will take for the bear certainly we replied if you will say why you want it is it for professional purposes for the bear was fat oh no i should not think of such a thing said the butcher i want him for a pet very well how high will you go we asked up to ten pounds the butcher replied but though we did our best the owner would not accept 
less than eight hundred francs to the great disappointment of the would-be purchaser what is required for an everyday pet is that it shall be beautiful and intelligent that it shall neither be too large nor too delicate and if a bird that it shall sing or talk preferably both the two first requirements will not go far to limit the choice beauty of form and harmony of colour are the most inseparable attributes of that physical perfection which the natural life of animals demands and he would be a rash man who classed any of the more highly organised animals as stupid without trial but there are diversities of gifts and the exquisite beauty of the silky little chinchilla must be held to compensate for the want of the lively cleverness of the cotimundi or the capuchin monkeys the limits set by size and constitution are the main consideration in the choice of pets yet even so the possible range is very great and might well extend far beyond the species which form the main body of those usually seen in this country to begin with our native animals who has seen a tame hare most schoolboys have kept tame rabbits by the dozen singularly uninteresting pets when shut up all day in a box munching cabbage stalks and generally turned over to younger sisters in favour of a terrier puppy after brief possession yet even after the experience of tame hares so charmingly told by cooper the most domestic of poets the hare is neglected as a pet yet its form and fur are beautiful and so far as the writer has been able to judge of this perhaps one of the least carefully observed except for persecution of our wild animals the hare is a clever affectionate creature as far above the rabbit in the scale of intelligence as it is in physique last spring after a late fall of snow an old hare brought her leverets from the hill and hid them in a straw stack near a farm and remained constantly near them all day coming to them regularly as soon as the twilight made it safe they are bold as well as affectionate and have been known to drive off a hawk which was carrying away a young one springing up and striking the bird as it flew low above the ground and their attachment to locality is so great that even if kept at large they would probably not leave their owner's grounds a charming little foreign pet for the house is the surrogate or meerkat this pretty creature which if we remember rightly was among the number of frank buckland's animal companions is an active and vivacious little fellow some ten inches long with greenish-brown fur large bright eyes a short pointed nose and dainty paws which like the squirrels or the raccoons are used as hands to hold to handle and to ask for more eloquent in supplication tenacious in retention the surrogate's paws are expressive plaintive and wholly irresistible the creature is made for a pet and is so affectionate to its master that it can undergo any degree of spoiling without injury to its temper a larger more beautiful and most charming creature not unlike the surrogate in some respects though in no way related to it is the brown opossum from tasmania sooty phalanger is the elegant name given to it by naturalists but except when the specimen kept by the writer discovered that a chimney made a good substitute for a hollow tree for its midday sleep there was nothing in its appearance to justify the scientific adjective the fur is of the richest dark brown and covers its prehensile tail like a fur boa its head is small with a pink nose and very large brown eyes and it has a compound hand with the claws on its fingers and an almost human and clawless thumb with the aid of which it can hold a wine glass or eat jam out of a teaspoon that owned by the writer was without exception the most fearless and affectionate pet he has ever known in the evening when it was most lively it would climb on to the shoulder of any of its visitors and take any food given it it had a mania for cleanliness always washing its hands after taking food or even after running across the room and was always anxious to do the same office by the hands of any one who fed it it made friends with the dogs and would wash their faces for them 
catching hold of an old setter's nose with its sharp little claws to hold it steady while it licked its face the staircase and banisters furnished a gymnasium for exercise in the winter and in summer it could be trusted among the trees in the garden this opossum is becoming scarce owing to the demand for its fur but there is little doubt that specimens could still be bought for a moderate sum that owned by the writer cost three pounds the american gray squirrel is a common and hardy species which becomes very tame though scarcely so pretty as our red squirrel and the south american cotis especially the small kind are most amusing pets though like the mongoose they need to be kept warm all the cotis are sociable lively creatures quite omnivorous and with as many odd tricks as a monkey the mongoose that familiar of indian households has such a natural bias for human society that according to mr kipling it will often come into a house from the jungle and voluntarily enroll itself among the members of the family it is a slim active little animal varying from a foot to nearly two feet in length of a curious mottled silvery gray color and so amazingly rapid in its movements that its victory over the cobra is not surprising provided that it is kept warm in winter it will live well in an english home and loses none of those domestic qualities which make it such a favorite in india the marmot and the vashaka or prairie dog are amusing little fellows and if allowed the use of a small enclosure in which the marmots can burrow and make hay for the winter and the vishakas make their collections of curiosities either species would no doubt add to the interest of an english country house but as both the marmot and the vishaka hibernate in winter their owner must be prepared for their disappearance underground from christmas until march there is only one monkey which we can thoroughly recommend as an indoor pet the beautiful and intelligent little capuchin the marmosets even more beautiful and equally pleasing are too delicate for our climate and die of colds and coughs after the first fogs of winter but the lively little capuchins may be kept for years in an english house and no monkey approaches their good temper and pretty winning ways they all have good round heads with black fur on the top and light brown on the cheeks some have pinkish faces and others dark brown skins with eyes like brown jewels their faces are most expressive and seldom still for they take deep and abiding interest in everything in or about their cages one kept in a large house in leicestershire had the lent to put out burning paper which it did most adroitly by beating it with its hands or knocking it against the floor another which was kept at the zoo would if it got a match collect a heap of straw strike the match light its bonfire and dance round it this dangerous accomplishment led to its removal from the cages on saturdays and bank holidays when the crowd makes it difficult to keep a watch on its movements the capuchin is so small so pretty and so clever that it seems to embody all the good and none of the bad points of monkey nature no one who has seen pumas when kindly treated in captivity can doubt the justice of the impression that these friendly and beautiful cats at once produce that they must be suited for pets and companions the general verdict of south americans as to their gentleness and natural liking for man even when wild on the pampas is given in some detail in a later chapter on animal temper there was at least one puma kept as a pet in this country by captain marshall the owner of a unique private menagerie at marlow on the thames reports of a gentleman with a tame lioness by his side having been seen sitting by a lock gate on the thames evidently pointed to the taming not of a lioness which however domesticated among those whom it knows would be too dangerous and uncertain a creature to take abroad but of a puma which being neither striped nor spotted would be at once described as a lioness by the ordinary man in a boat this was the case and the following is captain marshall's short account of his late pet for unfortunately it died of liver complaint before the writer could ask to make its acquaintance 
my big full-grown puma writes its master was as tame as a cat it was kept for months on a chain and collar and could be led about it would rest its head on my lap and i could pull it about as much as i liked i also had a baby one but she was not tame the lovely snow leopard which came to the zoo in 1894 was a lady's pet it had always been fed upon cooked meat and was perfectly tame the writer has patted it as it lay in its box in the lion house and it merely looked up exactly like a sleepy gray angora cat yet this was a full-grown leopard in perfect condition and health living in the next cage to one of the black variety which was almost the wildest creature in the menagerie those who possess an aviary may be interested to hear that at the zoo black caps white throats garden warblers and nightingales all birds of passage are living in excellent health through the winter and one nightingale was singing on december twenty nine but the song though very beautiful was not a true nightingale's note but largely borrowed from that of the bobo in the next aviary the bird being a young one caught in the autumn it is evident from the experiment at the zoo that our summer warblers may be kept as pets but the bird of all others suited for the aviary but neglected as a rule in england is the bobo the persian variety has the finest song but the indian is an even prettier bird and sings exquisitely in appearance the bobos are not unlike the bohemian waxwing with a black conical topknot cinnamon colored backs red and white or yellow and white cheeks and white breasts with some bright color near the tail the note is most liquid and beautiful and the bird has a pretty habit of varying the volume of the sound singing loudly in the open and almost whispering its song to its master or mistress if confined in a room we might do worse than follow the example of the persians and make the bulbul our favorite cage bird instead of the canary end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty three the paris zoological gardens in the two sieges here is an odd scene in the jardin des prins at the end of april eighteen seventy one the communards were defending the ramparts and a steady rain of shells had been pouring in from the versailles batteries for a week everyone in paris was stale from continued siege and bombardment war had lost all its excitement and nothing relieved its squalid discomfort an order to impress all citizens for the national guard had just been issued and one of these monsieur henri de goncourt an author a man of taste and a man of peace had wandered into the jardin des plans partly from sheer ennui partly as he would have us believe in the hope that he might find an empty loose box of a deer or antelope in which he could sleep and escape the requisition militaire of the omnipotent monsieur pibonbois he found a party of national guards sauntering round the gardens conducted by a philosophical republican who halted his squad in front of the kangaroo's cages and gravely took for his text the maternal virtues of citoyen kangaroo begging them with emotion to observe the contrast of the animal which always carried its infant in its pocket with the indifference of les femmes aristo to their babies the republican zeal for improving the occasion is typical of the frame of mind to which the average parisian can always bring himself and his audience over any political or patriotic question on the most trifling occasion a kind of a conscious insincerity which his hearers agree to share in order to enjoy the sentiment of the moment 
but the time and occasion are not often so comical the observer of the scene m de goncourt a writer steeped in the literary life of paris a life which the siege had starved and crushed leaving the poor man in a state of acute mental starvation very curiously shown in his journal of the siege declared that the animals which had survived the first siege or had been introduced to the gardens after the prussian occupation were almost as bored by the loss of their public as he was at the loss of his the animals he says are silent the elephant abandoned à son poubli, leaning indolently against the wall was eating his hay with the air of a man compelled to dine alone in the first siege the animals of the paris zoo which could by any means be classed as game or venison early found their way into the butchers and game dealers shops as early as october three two large stags were exposed for sale at the same time big tame carps which had adorned the fountains in the gardens were rubbing their purple noses against the sides of a baby's bath set upon the counter and a young bear freshly killed its broad paws clenched in death was hanging like a sheep from the hooks above destined for auction by hungry parisians on the following day on the last night of the old year in the shop of the butcher Rus, in the boulevard Haussmann, far less appetizing viands were the subject of a sale which for the moment was invested with an interest equal to that attending an auction of masterpieces of art at christie's the last batch of animals from the jardin de acclamation was on offer to supply the materials for a new year's dinner the trunk of pollux a young elephant was the central attraction and among a number of unfamiliar heads and horns a shopman was pointing to a pile of camel steaks the butcher was concluding his speech in the centre of a circle of women it is forty francs a pound for the fillet or the ribs yes forty francs dear you say not at all i do not see my way to making a penny on it i counted on three thousand pounds and he the elephant has only cut up into twenty three hundred pounds the feet you ask the price of the feet are twenty francs the other portions eight francs to fourteen francs a pound allow me to recommend the elephant sausage there is onion in my sausage ladies and gentlemen de goncourt was able to purchase two larks for his breakfast like the toasted mice of the hero of bulwer lytton's parisiens dainty but not nutritious that evening he found at voisin the famous elephant sausage and he dined on it the rarer animals from the jardin de acclamation in the bois de bouillon were transferred before the siege to the jardin des plans these were mostly bought by the proprietor of the english butcher's shop m dubos he also bought the elephants of the jardin des plans for twenty seven thousand francs personally i have eaten the flesh of elephants wolves cassowaries porcupines bears kangaroos rats cats and horses says the author of the englishman in paris his views on these creatures as articles of food are only given at length in the case of the dog cat and horse the last was supposed to have become a recognized part of the food supply of paris in the year before the siege but it never acquired any popularity it is very curious but a positive fact nevertheless that i have heard parisians speak favorably afterwards of dogs and cats flesh even of rats baked in a pie i have heard them say that for once in a way and under ordinary circumstances they would not mind partaking of these dishes i have never heard them express the same good will towards horseflesh one thing is certain at the end of the siege the sight of a cat or dog was a rarity in paris while by the official reports there were thirty thousand horses left the same writer records the opinion of an officer who was most successful in siege cookery on the subject of the dog as food this gentleman aided by a soldier servant had made an excellent dish of larks which turned out to be field mice slightly flavored with saffron to disguise their musky taste you may disguise anything with saffron except dog's flesh 
His meat is oily and flabby. Stew him, fry him, do what you will. There is always a castor oil flavor remaining, which cannot be got rid of. The only way to minimize that flavor, to make him palatable, is to salt, or rather pepper him, to cut him up into large slices and leave them a fortnight, bestrewing them very liberally with peppercorns. Then, before cooking them, put them into boiling water for a time, and throw the water away. All palates do not seem to have disliked dogs so greatly. At Brabant's, where Monsieur Renan and other leading writers dined regularly during the siege, a saddle of mutton was brought in. We shall have the shepherd served up tomorrow, said Monsieur Ebrard. It was explained that it was a très belle celle des chiens, and that this was the third time they had eaten dog. No, no, exclaimed Monsieur Saint-Victor, horrified. Monsieur Brabant is a respectable man. He would have told us horse, not dog. Dog or mutton, said Nefter, his mouth full. I have never eaten a better roti. If Brabant would give you a rat, it is excellent, a mixture of pork and partridge. During this dissertation, poor Monsieur Renan, who appeared preoccupied and thoughtful, grew pale, then green, threw his five francs on the table, and left hurriedly. The result of the compulsory experiments in food during the siege will not be much assistance to guide the work of acclimatization or to aid in the discovery of a new meat, either from the menageries of the zoological gardens or our beasts of burden, though all the needful accessories of good cooks, good wines, and good company were available to secure success. End of chapter 33「thirty four of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four other beasts of burden the failure of the zoological society to establish any new draught animal in this country seems to show that as long as an englishman can get a horse he tries to do without any other beast of burden the use of dogs is no longer legal and we have nearly discarded the sturdy ox even for ploughing a few are to be seen in Wiltshire and on the Cotswold Hills. In Berkshire there are some half-dozen teams, among them a famous quartet of red steers belonging to Sir William Throckmorton, and Mr. Beersford Hope's team of sheeted Dutch oxen, black giants with white sheets of identical shape, is one of the sites of the farm at Bedgebury in Sussex. But outside these counties we know of none in England." were we right to legislate against the use of dogs for draught a careful inquiry has been made in brussels and the verdict is that dogs are more useful than horses for minor town traffic quieter cleaner and cheaper the first distinctive institution that attracts the attention of a stranger in belgium writes the consul is the working dog liege is a city of great wealth and industry employing as many horses as any other town of its size in europe and yet for every horse at least two dogs are to be seen in its streets in the early morning we are told the boulevards are literally alive with them the butcher the baker the grocer the porter carriers of all kinds engage the dog services his step is so much quicker than that of the horse that he will in an hour cover twice as much ground and he carries with him a greater burden in proportion to his size six hundred pounds is the usual weight for an ordinary dog though a mastiff often draws as much again they cost about three pence a day to keep on black bread and horse flesh and draught dogs are now carefully bred mastiffs crossed with the bulldogs to give lungs and chest fetching the highest prices averaging from four pounds to six pounds the consul concludes by stating his opinion that there is not an article of merchandise from a ton of coals to a loaf of bread sold in our cities which might not be more advantageously delivered by dogs than horses the consul is doubtless thinking of ordinary tradesmen's deliveries it would be ridiculous to expect dogs to take the place of the brewer's dray horses or the railway goods horses but his views certainly deserve consideration in england where their use was once common we seem to look on dogs as only suitable for draught inside the arctic circle 
the absence of a strong shoulder and hard hoofs suggests cruelty in their employment nothing in holland and belgium gives an englishman a keener sense of discomfort than seeing dogs in carts his first impulse is to protest against it as ill usage in reply he will learn that a careful inquiry had been held many years ago that mr grantley berkeley whose personal affection for animals as shown in his memoir was almost a passion had been consulted and that the verdict had been in favour of continuing their use many months of careful observation confirmed this view no animal so enjoys his work or does it so willingly as a dog except the elephant no other animal can be trusted to work alone like the smuggler's dogs between france and belgium or collies watching sheep they are scarcely ever struck or beaten either in holland or belgium they do not fight and the only drawbacks to their use are their readiness to attack a stranger who approaches their cart when left in their charge and the severe hydrophobia scares which their numbers at times produce they are exuberantly happy in their daily work and come of their own accord at the right hour to be harnessed small dogs in little carts are always ready and anxious to race against big ones and though at the hague the barking and galloping of dogs within the city bounds is forbidden as furious driving is here the dogs when returning with empty carts may race as much as they please two little boys with their cart drawn by a sturdy bull terrier use often to wait for and race a couple of half-bred mastiffs drawing a cart with two men the owners running alongside and jumping on when the carts mere narrow shells like all dog carts whether on wheels or sledges were going at ten miles an hour there may be cruelty just as in the use of any other creature but men are always hardest on a sluggish animal one donkey suffers more than twenty dogs the legislation which stopped their use in england was nominally humanitarian but it has often been asserted that it was chiefly due to the objection which persons who drove horses entertained for dog carts and to the country gentlemen's dislike of dogs as enemies to game we should be sorry to see dogs replace ponies in common use but it should not be illegal to employ them we have seen a little pomeranian helping to pull its invalid master's chair and evidently proud of its work in this case it would have been difficult for the policeman to put the law in force in snow time we have harnessed a setter and a retriever to a toboggan sled and they enjoyed the fun quite as much as their master indeed they upset us at the first corner the english reliance on horses big and little is almost justified by the wonderful adaptation for manifold uses which careful breeding has produced the work of the dog must in civilized countries be limited to petty draft on well-made roads and in towns in the arctic circle he is a necessity to man as a beast of burden when the greenland dogs die the greenlander must become extinct it is impossible for him to drag home the seals sharks white whales and narwhals which he shoots on the ice without his dogs or for the eskimo to make his long migrations with his family and household goods to fresh hunting grounds without their aid if the epidemic of rabies which half destroyed their team had not been arrested by the ice fjord of jacobshaven the greenlanders would by now have been pensioners on danish charity it was noticed as evidence of the absolute dependence of the arctic man upon the services of the arctic dog as a beast of burden that whenever a native lost his dogs he went very rapidly downhill in the scale of eskimo respectability and became a sort of hanger-on to the fortunate possessor of a sledge team exactly the same degradation has been observed in the case of the tartar who is too poor to keep his horse and a corresponding rise in the social scale of the foot indians of patagonia when a neighboring tribe of horse indians lent them horses and provided them with hunters to teach their use in the capture of game on good ground a team of six eskimo dogs will draw a load of from eight to ten hundredweight at a speed of seven miles an hour large teams with light sledges and little except the driver to carry are wonderfully rapid kane the arctic traveller 
was carried for seven hundred miles at an average rate of fifty seven miles a day lieutenant schwatka sent two eskimo with a double team of forty dogs the sledge having its runners iced by pouring water over them to the rescue of a half-frozen sailor who was viewed from the ship at a distance of ten miles across an ice-covered bay just before nightfall two drivers sat on either side of the sledge with knives to cut the harness of any dog that might stumble and be dragged to death and the sledge was driven at perhaps the highest speed ever known the dash of ten miles was accomplished in twenty-two and a half minutes but creditable as such an achievement is to the half-starved descendants of the arctic wolf the strongest evidence against the use of the dog for general draft purposes is the fact that wherever the surface even in the snow regions is sound and safe for any other creature than the light and active dogs the reindeer or in the more southerly districts the horse at once takes its place there is one exception the great tibetan mastiff which stands apart these dogs the largest in size of any native and unimproved breed cross the mountains regularly as beasts of burden and bring their loads as far as darjeeling for size courage and general utility they are probably the finest race of dogs in the world but as a rule in asia the dog is the draft animal of the inferior races mr nortenskold in his voyage in the vega to the asiatic shore of the bering sea noticed a marked difference between the dog chucks the inhabitants of the coast and the reindeer chucks of the interior the latter were better clothed and in better circumstances both showed great kindness to their animals which is unusual among semi-savages the coast chucks always carry dog shoes neatly made bags of soft leather with straps attached to put on their dog's feet if cut by the sharp snow the herd of a reindeer cutch came down from the pasture every morning to meet their master the leading stag came first and bade him good morning by gently rubbing his nose against his master's hands all the other deer were then allowed to do the same the master taking each by the horn and carefully examining its condition the inspection over the herd then wheeled and returned to the pasture it would be difficult to name another beast of burden so tame and so efficient as the reindeer a good reindeer will travel one hundred miles a day over frozen snow and can draw a weight of three hundred pounds thus surpassing the dog by one half in distance and two-thirds in drawing power the loads carried by the camels of the heavy camel corps across the bayuda desert were very little heavier than those drawn by the reindeer across the northern steppes including the rider the average weight was about three hundred and forty two pounds even so they were overweighted and the little egyptian horses ridden by the hussars who accompanied the column were less exhausted than the larger beasts when the forced march was completed the llama admirable as it was for climbing the steppe roads of the incas which ruined pizarro's horses is only an inferior camel and the yak tibetan goat and buffalo are highly specialized forms suited to particular climates and conditions the water buffalo is the one domestic animal which evolves the enthusiasm and affection of the chinaman he loves it as the hindu does his cow and paddles by its side in the squashy rice fields with a smiling contentment on his bland countenance due to a feeling that in his buffalo he owns the one thing needful to make his husbandry a success and satisfaction of all the creatures of the flowery land it is the only one which the celestial takes with him into the countries of the barbarians into which he migrates long ago the chinaman in singapore and the strait settlements became a buffalo breeder and now he has imported them into the sandwich islands there also the trotting ox is now established and is regularly ridden by the kanaka boys the breed is maintained in great purity and for pace and size they match the best animals of the indian plains but the elephant must still hold the first place as a beast of burden his normal load is eight hundred pounds so that in india he is reckoned equal to eight ponies to five pack mules or stout bullocks and to three and one-third of a camel 
next to the elephant in general usefulness we should be inclined to place the trotting ox of india all indian oxen can be trained to trot says mr lockwood kipling the sloping quarter and straight hock may possibly account for something in their more horse-like gait one of the first things to strike a stranger is the hurrying ox the recla a light two-wheeled cart drawn by a pair of oxen cheap speedy and convenient is the handsome cab of the natives of bombay all through the Maratha country the ox is the common draught animal differing in speed and size according to the work for which he is required cattle of the nagore breed used by rich men to draw their state carriages used to be kept near delhi for carrying dispatches mr Uot was informed that they would travel with a soldier on their back fifteen or sixteen miles in the day at the rate of six miles an hour the nagore cattle have none of the awkward swinging motion of the legs of the english cow they bring their hind legs under them in as straight a line as the horse they are very active continues mr Uat, and can clear a five-barred gate with the greatest ease one owner possessed a calf which would jump an iron railing higher than a gate and a bull which would leap the same railing to go to water and having drunk leap back again napoleon borrowed his idea of bullock transport for the first stages of his russian campaign from the indian army but the indian bullocks are shod napoleon's were not and the bullock transport was ruined before the frontier of poland was reached but even if this important detail had received attention it may be doubted whether a large experiment in the use of a new beast of burden ever succeeds in an old country natural selection never proceeds faster than when controlled by human necessity and though the dog may be reinstated in the tradesman's carts the ox continues to disappear from the dwindling area of arable land in this country End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five the soldier's camel bactrian camels says major a leonard in his work on the camel its uses and management are those from afghanistan or any other such cold climate would thrive just as well in a remount depot in england as they do at the zoo what in the world is to prevent their introduction into this country and the formation of camel and mule transport nothing that i can see major leonard speaks with the authority of one who has spent sixteen years as a transport officer and if the suggestion which he makes based as it is on the observation of the good health and long lives enjoyed by the northern camels at the zoological gardens be adopted by the war office the original intention of the founders of the society to make their gardens an example of what was possible in the way of acclimatization would be fulfilled in an unexpected quarter the reason for major leonard's suggestion is to be found in the failure in the management of our camel transport in wartime the natural liking of englishmen for domestic animals of all kinds is quite equalled by the skill they usually show in their management yet the suffering of our transport animals in war are such as at any other time would cause a pang to the national conscience it is a fact that the feeling of humanity which will not tolerate the overcrowding of a cattle ship is scarcely shocked when as in the afghan war twenty thousand camels perish mainly from mismanagement or when a transport officer can write of the fate of those creatures in the nile expedition seeing as i have done hundreds and thousands of camels die from sheer exhaustion brought on by neglect and ill-treatment arising from downright stupidity obstinacy and ignorance is enough to make one ashamed of having had any connection with the business the push across the bayuda desert was a race against time yet it hardly seems consonant with the usual fairness of englishmen to their mounts that of the thousand camels used probably not one survived the treatment it received 
and count gleichen writing after service with the camel corps throughout the war says i am afraid we looked upon them as mere machines for carrying and hardly thought of their suffering from hunger and thirst as long as they could be whacked along this was after the battle of metame of the same example of cruel and disastrous mismanagement sir c rivers wilson says the camels had been without water for from six to seven days having been accustomed to water every second or third day they were on one-third rations which they did not always get for thirty-seven hours they were tied down so tightly in the zeriba before abu clay that they could not move a limb and i doubt if they were fed at all during that time then for sixteen hours they were on the march and tied down for another twenty-four hours without any food the result almost justified the saying that we thought we had found in the camel an animal which required neither food drink nor rest we certainly acted as if the camel were a piece of machinery except during the time of battle all this cruelty to the animals and waste of mobility in the force was unnecessary the so-called desert was full of food and well supplied with water on the day before the retreat from metame a camel convoy of the friendly kababish came in across the desert in perfect condition it made my mouth water writes an officer to see these magnificent well-fed brutes swinging along each with its load balanced on its hump his own beast had holes in its skin into which you could have put a coconut read in the light of these facts the inimitable ballad in which mr rudyard kipling sums up the miseries of the commissariat camel and the incompetence of the uninstructed british private to manage it is an invitation to substitute common sense and kindness for ignorance and cruelty in the treatment of the four-footed army which helps to fight our battles major leonard has been engaged in this service in afghanistan south africa indian and the soudan that is in itself a credential for his book for no one not possessed of an equable and reflective temper could have gone through his experiences and yet be enthusiastic over his branch of the profession and above all over what he justly calls that little-known and strangely unsympathetic animal the camel yet major leonard's practical experience leads him to the conclusion that of all transport animals it is the best for military use in the east incidentally he gives us an historical note on mr rudyard kipling's immortal ballad on the commissariat camel the driver question in afghanistan was enough to appall the heart of the stoutest transport officer they deserted and soldiers had to be told off to act as drivers on december twenty eighteen seventy eight i had to leave a hundred and sixty one bags of commissariat stores on the ground many of the drivers having deserted and taken their camels with them this is a common trick of the send drivers they go back by a circuitous route and in many cases it is said are re-engaged by the commissariat the place assigned to the camel in this estimate need not raise any bright ideal of the creature as a travelling companion mr r kipling's remark that you might as well lavish your affection on a luggage van as on a camel still holds good but there is a balance in favour of the camel when compared with other oriental beasts of burden the experiences of a single march noted by major leonard gives a glimpse of the comparative cussedness of different transport animals which is as fresh as it is amusing the occasion was the advance of the kandahar force from Quetta in the last afghan war at the crossing of the river laura at the foot of the kojak amran range the camels were swallowed up wholesale in the quicksands owing entirely to their extraordinary stupidity we quote this incident first because the one serious drawback to the use of the camel consists precisely in this strange insensibility to danger 
the river was not very broad and not more than two feet deep in any part of the stream but the bed was full of quicksands in whose treacherous depths many an unfortunate camel perished it is only natural to suppose that by sheer force of example an ordinarily intelligent animal would have learnt to avoid the danger by seeing those which preceded it sinking deeper and deeper out of sight yet these camels plodded steadily on into the quicksands though those which had preceded them were disappearing so fast that in many cases only their necks and heads were visible not a single horse elephant or mule was lost in this way in crossing the ford and they one and all displayed a marked and consistent caution which was clearly the result of reason one elephant at which the officer commanding the six eleven battery of the royal artillery lent to assist in extricating some camels which were being engulfed in the quicksands showed an amount of sagacity which was positively marvellous it was with the utmost difficulty that we could get him to go near enough to attach a drag rope to one camel i wanted to rescue in spite of our being about fifty yards from the bank of the river he evinced the greatest anxiety while his movements were made with extreme caution despite coaxing persuasive remonstrance and at last a shower of heavy blows dealt upon its head by the exasperated mahout this elephant stubbornly refused to go where he was wanted but with his trunk shoved out in front of him kept feeling his way with his ponderous feet placing them before him slowly deliberately and methodically treading all the while with the velvety softness of a cat and taking only one step at a time then suddenly he would break out into a suppressed kind of shriek and retreat backwards in great haste when the animal had nearly completed a circuit of the ground with the same caution and deliberation he advanced to within ten yards of the poor camel but not another inch would he move though several men were walking between him and the camel without any signs of the ground giving way but if the camel is too mechanical the elephant is too soft for the hardships of the baggage train or rough country he requires good roads a temperate climate and meals not only regular but luxurious ten elephants out of eleven reached kandahar safely in eighteen seventy eight on a diet of chapatis rice sugar and two bottles of rum apiece after their supper no wonder the faces of the men and their remarks as they looked on with watering mouths and overpowering envy were worthy of a camp ballad by rudyard kipling yet this is we submit an error on the right side both in economy and efficiency which cost most the elephant's comforts on the road to kandahar or the ninety-two camels which dropped from exhaustion and hunger on the first day's march back from metemay where the day before fifty thousand pounds weight of stores had been flung into the nile the patient ox combines the cunning of the mule with a spirit of revenge which is generally attributed to the camel though count glycan states that only one case of camel bite was reported to him during the nile expedition a leading bullock on the kandahar march lay down six times and when it was at last reluctantly agreed that the creature must be dying from exhaustion it rushed at a private and tossed him ten feet in the air then on to the next man and sent him flying and lastly at its own driver whom it tumbled over like a ninepin while the rest took refuge behind the wagons the creature would not move in harness and finally had to be unyoked and driven into camp the mule is the handiest and hardiest the donkey the least trouble and the pony the pleasantest of all pack animals according to major leonard's experience the spanish donkeys and sicilian mules being perhaps the finest and most useful of their respective kinds but though military opinion is on the whole in favour of the mule he gives facts and figures to show that the camel unmanaged as it is is a still more economical and effective beast for military service its power enduring hunger and thirst is greater it carries double the load of two mules needs fewer drivers is never shod and costs less to buy and less to keep 
for food and water have to be carried for miles in desert country while the camel browses on almost any shrub and can make the ordinary caravan march from well to well this opinion must not rest on general considerations for the good working example of the comparative efficiency of the two animals in a campaign is obtainable lord roberts on his march from kabul to kandahar covered a daily average of fourteen and a half miles for nineteen days this was done with mules and ponies the camels belonging to the regiments being exchanged for the former in the Bayuda desert the camels travel thirty-four miles daily in the first march and allowing for the two days rest and two of fighting nearly thirty miles a day in the second march of two hundred miles but in this case the camels were starved and worked to death the difference between the careful treatment of the cavalry horse marbo's reminiscences of his life as a cavalry officer must have opened the eyes of many readers to the practical anxieties of that profession and the ignorant neglect of the camel suggests a doubt whether the englishman is really so adaptable as we are pleased to think the two hundred pages which major leonard devotes to instruction in feeding watering loading doctoring equipping and purchasing camels contains so many glimpses of the obvious that the reference as to our general neglect of this indispensable animal for asiatic warfare is irresistible the two great breeding grounds of the camel are the whole central zone of asia north of the himalayas and the centre and northern fringe of the african soudan with the latter we are in touch through the frontier tribes of egypt and there is little doubt that we could make egypt the nucleus of a camel transport unrivalled in the history of the world but unless our officers and men have some training in their management the suffering camels will continue to cause as they have hitherto in our frontier wars an embarrassed strategy neglected sick and an ill-supported soldiery a permanent camel transport service in egypt and on the northwest frontier of india would probably save in our next considerable war millions of money and hundreds of soldiers lives End of chapter 35chapter 36 of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 36 the canadian beaver indian tradition ascribes the rescue of the world from its aqueous ages to the industry and intelligence of the beaver the animal which first lent to control and turned to account the opposing elements of land and water the beavers were of gigantic size before the great spirit smoothed them down to their present dimensions after they had completed his work on the unfinished earth and they with their fellow workers the muskash and the otter dived and brought up the mud and with it made mountains and lakes caves and cataracts dividing the land from the waters while the envious spirits of evil pelted the titan beavers with gigantic rocks which still strew the plains and valleys with monstrous boulders of misshapen stone if the legend needed any justification beyond its picturesqueness and simplicity a study of mr martin's work on the history and traditions of the canadian beaver would almost bear out the indian belief that the intelligence and mechanical skill of the beaver were prior and superior to that of man in the development of the new world the exaggerated descriptions of the beaver lodges and engineering feats given by the early french canadians hardly deserves the author's condemnation the works themselves are so complete and so ingenious that the symmetrical addition of early explorers add but little to the facts which their incomplete observations only partially grasped that a creature whose engineering structures were based consciously or unconsciously on principles only known to highly civilized man should embellish them with conveniences known to half-civilized man was a natural inference 
and to credit the beaver with a wish to insert windows in the walls of his lodge was no great flight of fancy to men who had seen with their own eyes that the same animal could construct a dike a mile long with the precise section which human experience has determined to be that best adapted to resist the forces of pent-up water mr martin has so well fulfilled the promise of his title page to present an exhaustive monograph popularly written on the life and history of the beaver that an attempt to follow the varied commercial historical and paleontological references in which the story of the beaver abounds would be impossible it will perhaps be sufficient to consider the main questions of the extraordinary intelligence exhibited by the animal and the possibility of its preservation from the total destruction with which the species is now threatened so far as the most careful modern observation shows there is but one claim which has been seriously made for the beaver's sagacity which is matter for doubt it has been asserted that the animal always cuts the trees it selects so that they may fall towards the water there is evidence that this is not always the case but trees growing near the water naturally tend to lean towards the stream and naturally extend the heaviest growth of branches over the water where light and space are greatest and the greater number of those cut by the beavers would probably fall in that direction without any special provision but the inseparable features of a beaver colony the dike or dam and the less famous but almost equally wonderful canal suggests an estimate of brain power or inherited instinct for mechanics which an exhaustive examination of the facts heightens rather than diminishes the object of the dam is to supply a temporary want not a permanent necessity always present to the beaver mind in summer the beavers wander up the stream finding food without difficulty in winter they require a permanent supply of water at a certain level in which they can swim beneath the ice store their supply of branches for food so as to be accessible without exposing themselves and keep a moat round their lodges left to itself the stream would run low in winter when the freezing of the snow and earth stops the water supply hence the necessity for the dam to maintain it at a constant level such a train of arguments supposes a number of concepts in the beaver's brain which would occur to no other animal to carry it out efficiency would puzzle most human beings not acquainted with engineering moreover the work must be done with the material at hand so that beaver dams are found built of branches and mud of grass of sand and of mud only to get the wood to the water side the beaver clears paths or rolling ways cuts a water channel to meet and assist in the transportation of the wood and in some cases actually makes a long canal for water carriage and safe travelling though the beaver canal is not so popularly known writes mr martin and is more easily reconciled with instinct it must not be supposed that it is a minor feature in the performance of this animal it is almost incredible that a work so apparently artificial could have remained unnoticed till eighteen sixty eight when mr morgan published his valuable notes so amply illustrating the works of the american beaver when the colony has been settled quietly for many years and has cut all the desirable trees close at hand and further supplies are sometimes hundreds of yards away the necessity for clear rolling ways and good canals is obvious no doubt the necessity is obvious but that does not explain the wonder that a small rodent animal should anticipate civilized man and make a road to bring commodities to its city instead of shifting to a fresh encampment like the red indian himself when supplies are exhausted our estimate of the individual intelligence of beavers must greatly depend on the power of adaptation shown by them in special cases mr martin seems to lean to the opinion that the creature is controlled by a dominant instinct which makes its action almost automatic and alleges this want of adaptability as an insurmountable obstacle to its domestication 
the instances given of its behavior in captivity hardly justify such a conclusion a tame beaver kept as a pet in a trapper's hut used to lie before the fire as contentedly as a dog it was not till winter set in that it became a nuisance poor old bill McHugh's house was well ventilated an open chink between the logs being thought very little of by himself and his family but the beaver was very impatient of such negligence and used to work all night at making things airtight and comfortable without much discrimination as to the materials it employed if bill or his guests went to bed leaving their moccasins and tichigans drying before the fire they were certain to be found in the morning stowed away in some chink or cranny and stray blankets and articles of clothing were found torn up for the same purpose that was contrary to our notions of housekeeping but the beaver's wish to keep out the cold was not more instinctive than that of any squatter's wife on a surrey heath the preparations made to meet the severe cold of the winter of eighteen ninety by the beavers at the zoo in regent's park were an odd mixture of cleverness and what seems too like the stupidity of instinct their lodge was partly their own building and partly subsidized by the authorities that is it had a roof of corrugated iron supported by strong posts at the corners the sides were carefully built up with branches set on end by the beavers themselves and well plastered with mud which they push in with their forepaws and pat down hard they not only carried the plaster up to the eaves of the house but patted a quantity of mud down on the iron roof a quite unnecessary labor except on the assumption that there were joints in it which require filling the whole was crowned with a pile of branches which served no useful purpose last year these beavers dug a canal from the stone-rimmed pond to one of the burrows running under their house we were not able to see whether it actually joined the pond or whether the rim of stone which divided it from the pool at the surface was continued downwards in any case they had managed to fill the canal with water and had a clear waterway from the house to the edge of the pool they were busy cutting through a poplar stem the largest chip of wood lying at its foot measuring three and a half inches another stump was being carefully gnawed into fine sawdust which was probably intended for bedding since then the beavers have been supplied with a fine new house of concrete which will probably keep out their enemies the rats which invaded the old house though it will leave less inducements to the animals to go on with their interesting building feats yet as soon as the new house was completed they at once set to work to scratch out a canal in the run and managed to fill it partly with muddy water if the beaver is to be saved from extermination some means for its artificial preservation must be found though from the failure of the attempts made in prussia and elsewhere in central europe to save the species so late as seventeen twenty five an edict was published in berlin prohibiting the destruction of the beavers of the elbe mr martin is not hopeful of success even in canada lord bute's colony in the island from which he takes his title appear to have been less fortunate than was at first supposed in eighteen eighty three when it was desired to send specimens to the fisheries exhibition it was found that their numbers as estimated by the work done had been much exaggerated and the enclosure was completely ransacked before a couple could be secured one hundred and eighty-seven large trees were cut down by the beavers between eighteen seventy four and eighteen seventy eight in that time they dammed a pool seventy-eight yards long and constructed seven dikes one having an embankment of one hundred and five feet but in spite of the difficulties which their engineering industry presents to their would-be preservers proposals for a beaver ranch are still being discussed in canada and though experience forbids the hope that they can be kept for profit sentiment may yet succeed in preserving the creature which has been adopted as the totem of the palefaces colony by the great lakes End of chapter thirty six Chapter thirty seven of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 37 The Temper of Animals the old theory that animal good temper might be accounted for on the ground that animals are sensible of pleasure and pain but not of advantage and disadvantage was only a half-truth for animals are subject to jealousy and jealousy is the direct result of a feeling of personal disadvantage but it draws attention to the fact that occasions for disagreement in the case of most animals are rare and unusual Questions of domicile are almost the sole ground of discord in the animal world, with the exception of the fierce dissensions raised at pairing time, and even in the last case, combat is only general in the case of polygamous animals. Deer fight more fiercely than wolves, and wild sheep than lions, and though there is, or was, an eagle in the zoo, which was caught locked in the talons of another eagle when fighting in the spring, the fiercest birds are usually friendly with their own species, and while roughs and black game fight like gladiators for their wives, the eagles and the peregrines, as a rule, mate in peace. Proximity, the severest trial to human temper, seldom ruffles the animal mind, and different species live in harmony together, each seeming, as in the case of the owls and the prairie dogs, or rooks and starlings, rather to prefer than shun the society of the other the choicest spots for homes are naturally the source of warfare among birds and other animals frequently fight for the possession of some favourite breeding place badgers and foxes which have shared the same earth during the winter often fight for sole possession in the spring when the fox invariably wins a result which would hardly be expected from the relative physique of the two animals but such quarrels are only for the sake of rearing their young not for selfish reasons and even apprehended pressure of the food supply rarely excites ill will except in the case of the largest carnivorous birds and animals which require a wider range for hunting and drive their young to other districts the rodents and ruminants are less jealous and that strong social and gregarious instinct which the existence of ill-temper as a permanent characteristic would inevitably destroy keeps them together in peace and harmony they love society and not the least marked difference between the temperament of animals and men is that animals do not by mere contact irritate each other a positive and not unimportant compensation for the absence of the gift of speech since occasions of difference are so few nothing but the assumption of an ancient and inbred malignity in animal minds such as the author of three men in a boat supposes in the case of fox terriers to have been due to a double dose of original sin could justify the view so generally held that animals are as a rule ferocious and ill-tempered a notion summed up in mr burnand's conclusion in happy thoughts that most of the creatures with which he came in contact in the country were when not dangerous always very uncertain the exact contrary would be nearer the truth animal temper is naturally pacific equable and mild bad temper is the privilege of more highly organized natures and the mild resentment of the placable tiger finds its development in the apoplectic fury of the mandrel and the measured malice of mankind horace's suggestion that prometheus added to the ill temper of man the strength of a mad lion must be taken literally the general law of good nature in the animal world makes the exceptions all the more remarkable quarrelsome species appear among a friendly tribe just as an ill-tempered individual does in a kindly species the ruminants are a most peaceful race yet deer are savage and so is that handsome indian antelope the nigai a tame stag is a very dangerous pet and even the beautiful roebuck has been known to kill a boy in a wild fit of rage but the fiercest and most vindictive of all with the exception of the cape buffalo is the south african new which never loses its ill temper when tamed and always remains among the few dangerous animals which the keepers at the zoo have to deal with 
hardly less ill-tempered are the zebras and the wild asses which suggest that animal mismanagement is not entirely to blame for the occasional ill-temper and obstinacy of mules and donkeys to the ill-tempered species we may add the buffalo and the two-horned black rhinoceros the last is really ferocious charging down on any creature man or beast without provocation and capable of inflicting mortal wounds even on the lion the elephant or its own kind but among all the larger creatures of the animal kingdom it is difficult to find more than a dozen species which are as a class ill-tempered unless we include all those carnivorous animals which exhibit a certain ferocity in the capture of their prey but it will be found that apart from this law of their being such animals are not as a rule either ill-tempered or malicious on the contrary their natural bias is toward good nature and it may be inferred that the fierceness exhibited by them when actually striking their prey is rather a gradual development from a particular necessity than an essential part of their nature the good humour of the lions and other felidae was well illustrated by a scene at the zoo a few weeks ago the young lion from Sokoto was much intent on breaking in the iron shutter which separates the house it now occupies from its former quarters next door. Apart from the very proper wish to assert a right to its former domicile, it had the irritating stimulus supplied by an ill-tempered and decrepit old leopard, which was growling on the other side of the shutter, and even went so far as to insert one of its longest teeth into the crack between the shutter and the wall, as a reminder to the lion of what was waiting for it on the other side. The lion was striking constant heavy blows on the door, and was so intent on its occupation as to disregard the call of its keeper the keeper quietly attracted its attention by pulling its tail and the lion at once desisted rubbed its face against the keeper's hand and lay down to be stroked patted and have its mane caressed that good-tempered races contain very ill-natured individuals raises the difficult question of temperament a good authority on horses mr mayhew endeavours to show that ill-temper among them is accidental not innate in his work jibbing is shown to be due to brain disease shying to defective vision and temper to the mismanagement of man there is much truth but also much error here those best acquainted with the nature of domesticated animals know how greatly the temperaments of individuals differ Take, for instance, the case of three highly bred young Jersey heifers, of which the writer has watched the upbringing from their earliest days. They have never been frightened or struck. They have not even heard a rough word from their earliest days, even when they jumped the garden fence and browsed on an apricot tree. One is as gentle and domesticated as a well-bred cow can be. The others are ready with their horns at any or no provocation the same is true of horses some are so ill-tempered that they will kick or bite at any living thing that comes near them it is as impossible to trace these dislikes to any known cause as it is to find a reason for the antipathy which cows have for hares however great our liking for horses we cannot deny that some of the best thoroughbreds are revengeful quarrelsome and liable to frightfully sudden fits of rage no doubt this ill-temper is often accompanied by splendid qualities of endurance chestnut horses which have generally the most uncertain tempers are perhaps the most high-couraged but courage and temper are not always allied and temper and human management are not necessarily connected bendigo and surefoot were both trained in the seven barrows stable by the late mr joseph who always avoided any severity of treatment and never ran his horses light each as a three-year-old won a great race bendigo the cambridgeshire surefoot the two thousand guineas both carried off the eclipse stakes at sandown worth ten thousand pounds later in their career yet bendigo had a perfect temper while surefoot's is well known to be ferocious 
bendigo would train himself and however well he ran in trials on the white horse hill his trainer knew that he would do still better on the race course in his last race when he was just beaten when carrying a crushing weight watts gave him one stroke of the whip but the horse was doing all he could and the jockey did not touch him again in the stable the big brown horse was almost as friendly with strangers as he was with his devoted attendant bendigo pat and the rider has seen no prettier sight than that of his trainer's little daughter hugging dear old bendy's nose the horse had the courage and gentleness of a knight of romance surefoot on the other hand under identical treatment was dangerous in the stable and savage even when running in the actual race for the derby he tried to bite the jockeys on the horses in front of him and when being put into the horse box for the journey gave more trouble than a mercian bull yet this savage temper was not accompanied by unusual courage and endurance and in severe races the even-tempered bendigo was his undoubted superior peter another racehorse noted for his stubborn obstinacy once gave an interesting object lesson in temper as between man and horse at ascot the horse fought with his jockey archer for twenty minutes at the post but the indomitable good humour of the jockey won when the flag fell the horse went off with a rush but stopped in the middle of the track to kick archer neither moved nor struck him and peter then went on like the wind and won but horses of this temperament are the exception not the rule and the success with which we have developed power and courage without producing animals like cruiser or the celebrated general chasse of whom his owner mr kirby the dealer who sold largely in russia used to say that the emperor paul was nothing to him is one of the triumphs of domestication the union of reckless courage and habitual ferocity is rare in the animal world and the general law of good nature remains absolute and unquestioned end of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight criminal animals mr gladstone narrowly escaped a serious accident when taking exercise in hardin park a cow which had escaped from its owner when it being driven to market had taken refuge in the park and attacked mr gladstone when passing fortunately though knocked down mr gladstone escaped unhurt daily paper the general view of good or bad in animal disposition is no doubt mainly determined by their behaviour to ourselves that is the fixed opinion of the moral relation of animals to man but there is every reason to believe that there are a few individuals among the many in all species which have some pronounced and inborn bias towards mischief and ferocity which almost entitles them to a place in the criminal classes of animal society no excuse for instance can be found for the cow which so nearly ended the hopes of home rule by knocking down the greatest of all home rulers after spending a week or more in the hospital security afforded to her by the park at hardin after she had broken loose from her owners on the way to market she was in fact a heifer not a cow and so had no calf hidden in the fern whose protection might have been urged as an excuse for her ferocity and her conduct must be ascribed to some such ancient and inbred malignity as possessed the dun cow of warwick no doubt the last animal if legend be true was possessed by a deeper and darker instinct of hatred to the human race for she used to mingle with the herds and entice the milkmaids to perform their kindly office by all kinds of endearments known to her race and then most cruelly kill them until the renowned guy of warwick rid the country of the monster avenged the milkmaids and earned himself a place in story but the cow of hardin may in time win its way to the marvellous and have a place in the great gladstone myth by the side of joe or io 
once the friend now the foe of the hero whose legend is in after ages to be identified with the rationalistic record of the promise of three acres and a cow the danger to which mr gladstone was exposed which was a very real one suggests the question whether there is not some ground for supposing that apart from questions or our own convenience there are not some desperately wicked animals which are not only wicked per se but quite conscious that they are doing actions which place them outside the pale both of human and animal consideration we believe that there is not the least doubt of it any more than there is a doubt whether certain so-called criminal lunatics richly deserve hanging if animals had no power of self-control it would be nonsense to speak of them as either good or bad but they have the power of self-control when domesticated that we know it is only the knowledge that they have such power that induces a man to trust himself in a dog-cart behind a young horse or to ride in a howdah on an elephant but they must always have the same power when wild if they had not they could not be gregarious a condition which could only be maintained by submission to a law of live and let live which is perhaps better understood by wholly wild animals than by semi-civilized man gregarious animals not only exhibit self-control to the extent of not showing temper towards each other but even obey the command of their leader when obedience to the command must be extremely irksome witness major skinner's account of the elephant leader posting live vedettes round the tank at which the herd was then and not till then allowed to drink the rogue elephant which exhibits such unusual and malignant ferocity towards men as well as his own kind may be and often is an animal driven from the herd by a stronger rival sometimes he is merely suffering from excitement which passes away after a certain period but this though affording a reason for some of the abnormal conditions found in the actions of the rogue elephant does not account satisfactorily for the strange reluctance of its own species ever to readmit it to their society the rogue elephant even when driven from one herd is never admitted to another and though saunderson found them occasionally in company with other solitary of their own species sir j tennant records that even when driven into the kada a rogue elephant was never allowed to enter the herd of captives with which he was enclosed good temper is the fundamental condition of animal society and it is probably to the lack of this and the growing conviction that the rogue is an unclubable unsociable fellow that his exclusion is due when separated from the wholesome discipline of society his temper goes from bad to worse and he joins the ranks of criminal animals the wanton ferocity then developed is perhaps best shown by colonel saunderson's description of the state of things on the main road between mysore and usnan caused by a creature called the rogue of kankankot policemen were planted at the entrance of the jungle to warn travellers to proceed only in parties and even then the wretched carabas who lived in the forest were from time to time caught and pulled to pieces limb by limb to gratify the ill temper of the elephant when mastered the naturally ferocious elephant has been known to die of sheer fury a noosed rogue in the kedah lay down and died though those suffering from the excitement of must are often reclaimed the ferocity of the rogue buffalo and rogue hippopotamus must probably be accounted for in the same way they are individuals which have become intolerable to their own species and being outlawed from society revenge themselves by the indulgence of their criminal bent instances of this homicidal mania among the animals at the zoo are by no means common the tact and good management which prevails in all the dealings of the keepers with their charges is largely responsible for this but one unquestionable example of this type of animal aberration occurred some years ago which might have had very serious consequences the temper of all the wild asses is very uncertain or rather very unreliable 
this natural surliness took the form of absolute ferocity in the case of a very fine male zebra the object of its especial dislike was not so much the occasional visitors to the stable as the keeper whose duty was to feed it and arrange its stable the viciousness was such that it would endeavour to climb the railings of its loose box in order to attack them there was absolutely no ground for this animosity for it had met with the same kind treatment and attention as the other creatures in the stalls it was clearly a case of the criminal instinct prevailing one sunday morning a frenchman who had some work to do in the zebra house accidentally left open the door which led into the box of this striped savage and when another keeper advanced to drive it back it rushed at him open-mouthed knocked him down knelt on him and would most probably have killed or maimed him if it had not been driven off by some of his fellow employees who most fortunately came to the rescue among domesticated animals the consciousness of evil-doing is far more clearly existent than among their wild relations where it can only be matter for probable conjecture and surmise perhaps the most convincing instances of the gratification of a consciously criminal instinct are to be found in the cases in which dogs especially sheep-dogs have been detected in the habit of going away to considerable distances at night and worrying the sheep in other folds returning before daybreak to their own flock in one case a collie was seen by a shepherd to slip away from the fold early in the morning and plunge into a stream where he swam for a short time came out shook himself and then galloped off in the direction of another farm to which on inquiry the dog was found to belong in the fold which it had just left several sheep were found dying and dead and it was surmised that the dog's bath had for its object the removal of the traces of its sanguinary amusement in another case two dogs were found to have been in the habit of slipping away at night and returning quietly to their kennel after killing sheep at a distance of ten or twelve miles in both instances the flock of which they were the natural guardians was uninjured the secret gratification of the criminal instinct is not confined to sheep-dogs in one case a mastiff ran wild and lived among the cheviot hills killing sheep at night and retiring to the roughest and most difficult ground during the day though more than once hunted by a pack of foxhounds he always prevailed on them to spare him lying down on his back and putting up his feet as a puppy will when a big dog approaches him it is more difficult to account for the extreme viciousness of certain horses creatures which have no hereditary tendency to cruelty like the dog whose ancestor the wild hunting dog is perhaps the most ferocious creature in the world what for instance are we to say of an animal like general chasse which commenced the day when being fled to york by kneeling on his groom and trying to tear him to pieces until a squad of labourers charged him armed with sticks and forks or of merlin who was obliged to be double chained to the rack in the painting-room when his portrait was being taken by mr herring and afterwards made use of his liberty by killing his groom another horse could only be groomed during several seasons by a series of well-timed dashes with a birch broom king pippin a celebrated irish horse which ran early in the century had a habit of rushing at and worrying any person who came within reach as he was being saddled and if he had a chance would get his head round seize his rider by the leg and pull him off his back when brought to the curra to run no one would put a bridle on his head a countryman volunteered to do so when the horse caught him by the chest shaking him as a dog does a rat fortunately for the poor fellow wrote an eye-witness of the scene his body was very thickly covered with clothes as an irishman on great occasion is fond of displaying the resources of his wardrobe and if he has three coats will put them all on the celebrated whisperer an old man named sullivan who had a strange power of taming vicious horses was sent for he remained shut up with the horse all night and next day exhibited him on the course as quiet as a sheep he won his race and for three years remained docile 
then he suddenly gave way to his criminal instincts and killed a man for which he was shot but considering the great number of horses on training and the accuracy with which their disposition and temper is known the instances of homicidal tendency in the horse are singularly few it will probably be found that bulls and even cows are responsible for nearly all the deaths deliberately caused by animals in this country it is the fashion to laugh at people who are nervous about cattle this is hardly fair or sensible there can be no two opinions as to the power of full-grown cattle to catch or kill any person who has not some shelter at hand though the owners who drive them along the roads never are willing to admit the possibility an amusing instance of this as well as of the local jealousies which ramble between people of different counties even if only separated by an imaginary border-line occurred to an acquaintance of the writer just within the border of cornwall where it marches with devon a farmer was driving cows down a narrow lane when some foot passengers remonstrated don't e be afeard ma'am shouted the owner and be a deal better behaved here than em be in devon in the case of the bull a period of savageness generally occurs once or twice in its life and in the number of fatal gorings inflicted by these brutes on the old labourers and boys who usually attend on them a fair case could be made out for making compulsory some precautions in their transport along public roads End of chapter thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine A Year at the Zoo. The report of the Council of the Zoological Society for the sixty fourth year of the existence of its gardens in Regent's Park will be read with interest by those whose curiosity extends beyond the menagerie which they see to its management which is unseen the public are only dimly aware of their debt to dr schleder the honorary secretary of the zoological society and to mr bartlett and his son managers of the gardens and the glimpse of a twelve-month history animal personal and financial of one of the most pleasing and popular outdoor institutions of london explains much that is not at first obvious on a visit to the zoo among the most evident improvements of recent years is the great and growing beauty of the gardens the fine turf and flowers and the other amenities which apart from the interest inseparable from the natural history collections have made possible in the precincts occupied by the society a nearer counterpart of the outdoor life enjoyed in the gardens of continental capitals than anywhere else in the metropolis the explanation of this as well as of the curious and interesting details of the maintenance of a menagerie of two thousand four hundred and thirteen birds beasts and reptiles of all kinds and sizes from the african elephant and indian rhinoceros down to the tiny lemmings and the last litter of dingo puppies is to be found in the financial report for the year it is a unique document and deserves attentive study those whose custom it is to buy paper packets of broken bread and buns duly labelled food for the animals at the refreshment stalls or who know from experience that there is hardly any creature there from the hippopotamus to the smallest monkey which disdains to eat a raisin will be astonished at the quantity and variety of the solid nutriment which has to be provided yearly for six hundred and fifty beasts one thousand three hundred and ninety one birds and three hundred and sixty-six reptiles though those more conversant with the powers of consumption of stock in an ordinary farmyard would probably hesitate to take a feeding contract at a lower figure the year's cost for provisions consumed in the gardens is a little under four thousand pounds one hundred five loads of clover one hundred and fifty three loads of meadow hay one hundred and thirty quarters of oats and three hundred and forty quarters of bran may be put down roughly as the quantity of vegetable food required for the large antelopes elephants zebras and wild sheep bread and milk are almost as safe a diet for most animals as for human beings and five thousand quarterns of bread and six thousand quarts of milk 
represent the quantity of this wholesome food consumed at the zoo most of the insect-eating birds many monkeys and certain snakes and lizards are egg-eaters and nineteen thousand eggs probably account for twice that number of breakfast supplied to the smaller occupants of the houses the large carnivora of which the collection contains so many and such fine examples require stronger food and are not stinted in their supply the figures in this case suggest some interesting reflections on the ravages said to be due to wild beasts among flocks and game no doubt these creatures notably wolves and wild dogs occasionally destroy more than they require to satisfy their hunger but usually a lion or a tiger kills one animal and feeds upon it so long as it lasts after which it kills another victim and no more the total of carcasses eaten by all the lions tigers bears hyenas wolves leopards and other large carnivora in the gardens during the year amounts to two hundred and thirty horses and a hundred and fifty two goats if the number consumed in captivity bears any proportion to the loss of cattle caused by these creatures when wild the reports of natives must be much exaggerated the fishmonger's bill is naturally a heavy one when not only seals otters and sea lions which will eat nothing else but also numbers of piscivorous birds and even the polar bears have to be provided with fresh flounders whiting and conger eels daily thirty six thousand pounds of whiting ten thousand pounds of rough fish six hundred and thirty quarts of shrimps and two thousand pounds of flounders were consumed by the seals and other aquatic creatures the live gudgeons whose pursuit and capture form the daily excitement of the penguins in their glass-fronted tank do not appear in the list of food provided any more than the army of mice and rats and dozens of live frogs which frolic behind the scenes in the snake-house unhonoured in their lives their deaths are unrecorded or figure darkly among miscellaneous expenses the fact is that the rearing of tame mice and rats and the capture and purveyance of live frogs is an interesting and unexplored side industry of london life breeding mice and white rats is an easy and lucrative addition to small incomes carried on in backyards and attics the frogs which are genuine wild animals are captured by special emissaries employed by the dealers who go round to the mouse farms and froggeries and collect the creatures just as the poultrymen make their rounds to country farms and cottages the zoo is by no means the largest customer to the trade which relies mainly on the biologists for its steady demand fruit is almost as necessary as fish at all seasons in the gardens and no visitor can have failed to notice the daintily arranged dessert of sliced bananas grapes dates and apples which is served up to the rarer monkeys and fruit-eating birds thirteen thousand oranges two thousand pounds of grapes one thousand two hundred pounds of dates and two hundred pounds of raisins and currants represent the fruiterer's bill the greengrocer comes last with two thousand six hundred and forty one bunches of tares four thousand five hundred bunches of greens and two thousand six hundred bundles of cress cherries onions melons marrows bananas and figs vary the bill of fare which we may close with a solid item of a hundred and thirty nine hundred weight of carrots and nearly two tons of ground nuts to provide for the welfare of its animal pensioners its works and repairs its gardens and to assist in the valuable scientific inquiries into animal structure carried out in the prosector's department the society employs under the direction of the superintendent and his assistant a head keeper twenty-two keepers a prosector's assistant clerks a head gardener twenty-three helpers in the menagerie twelve gardeners artisans firemen messengers and a butcher in all nearly one hundred persons at the society's rooms in hanover square the publication of the zoological record containing a complete summary of all the zoological inquiries of the year throughout the world costs annually about four hundred and fifty pounds the last and not the least interesting item in the list of expenditures 
is that of eight hundred forty three pounds nineteen shillings sixpence for the cost and carriage of animals five hundred pounds of which represents the money paid for the young hippopotamus whose comfortable figure and complacent demeanour have been not the least attraction of the gardens during the season twenty three thousand eight hundred and fifty five pounds has been the total cost of the zoo for the year eighteen ninety two this is covered by receipts of twenty five thousand nine hundred and sixty eight pounds the form in which these monies were received is perhaps less unusual than the items of expenditure but it includes one considerable source of income which would scarcely be expected fares for rides on the elephants and camels reach the respectable amount of six hundred and six pounds seventeen shillings four pence a sum which seems nearly constant in the recent annual records of the zoo admissions to the garden reached thirteen thousand nine hundred and eighty one pounds an increase of two hundred and seventy two pounds over last year and the subscriptions of fellows of the society amount to over six thousand pounds which represents roughly the sum in which the public after paying their entrance fees are indebted to the society lastly the assets at regent's park and in the offices at hanover square are valued at seventy thousand pounds including one estimate of twenty one thousand five hundred and forty two pounds for the animals in the menagerie and another of fifteen thousand six hundred pounds for the unrivalled library of zoology owned by the society with the exception of the young hippopotamus which in bulk at least is a substantial addition to the assets of the society the arrivals in the gardens were more than counterbalanced by the losses during the year the obituary of the last giraffe has already been given and it is interesting to notice that the report corroborates the fear there expressed that for the present there is no hope of obtaining a successor owing to the closure of the soudan by the mahdists we read the supply of this and other large african animals which were formerly obtained via kassala and sukkem has ceased and so far as can be ascertained there are now no living giraffes in the european market among the other deaths recorded are those of a lioness a male cheetah two common zebras an ardwolf and a beatrix antelope more than sixty monkeys also succumb to the intense cold of the winter on the other hand a large and varied progeny of young creatures was born in the gardens during the year and many hundreds of birds animals and reptiles were presented to the society by donors of all ranks and conditions from the queen whose gigantic ostrich occupies the empty giraffe house to the public schoolboy with a taste for natural history whose donation of a couple of yellow-bellied toads brought carefully to the gardens in his coat pocket is duly acknowledged in close proximity to the gift of her majesty the queen end of chapter thirty nine end of life at the zoo notes and traditions of the regent's park gardens by charles john cornish